nervous. I'm nervous about this topic because it's it's not a taboo topic, but it is an uncomfortable topic, right? Yeah. It is very uncomfortable, and if I'm going to be honest, It is very uncomfortable, and if I'm going to be honest, um, the reason that I personally I personally don't fear, uh, experience discomfort when I'm talking about finances, when I'm talking about personal finances, is because I am on a journey, and I have been on a journey for a very long time in trying to improve, constantly improve my finances. I've seen firsthand what happens to people individually, what happens to family when they are out of order with their, with their finances, with their spending, with wise decision-making when it comes to their finances. And so I personally don't find it to be an uncomfortable conversation. In fact, I wish more people would talk about it. I wish more people would be more open and vulnerable about their finances, about their spending, because I think in doing that, we can, as a community, really start putting our our ideals and um, information that we have together in order to help each other improve. But I, I notice for me personally, every time I bring up the topic of personal finance, whether it's to family, friends, I see how uncomfortable people get about it um some people downright shut down <laughs> like <laughs> like me yeah i was fin- listen when i look, said that I'm i, I happen to be look yeah up. you was trying to throw shade <laughs> no it's okay no 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 yeah no i, I can admit it i do shut down because like for me it's not that yeah i am uncomfortable because ooh, i'm uncomfortable because i know that i'm not a good steward of my money mm. and to admit that that's an uncomfortable feeling. It's a, it's an uncomfortable feeling to admit your sins yeah. to people you admire too, especially because like as your daughter, I admire you. I want to make you proud. So admitting something that I, I lack in or admitting my faults to you is even more of pressure. Yeah. Wow. Cause like I can easily do it with Jesus because I know that Jesus loves me despite my flaws and that he's going to get me through. But to actually voice it, that's the problem I have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so just for the record, since you brought it up, um, I love you despite your flaws, too. Period. Is it on a level of our Lord and Savior? No. No. I know that. No. That's why I go to him first. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I did. I, I promise I wasn't thinking about you when I, when I said that. But just as I said it, it hit me. Oh, that's... That's, that's that's our conversations. Yeah, that's all yeah. too. But I've seen it more widely in um, in various people that I've been talking about the topic with. They get very um, uncomfortable and, like I said, just shut right down. And granted, it's not on a level. I'm happy you said what you just said about you know because it's hard to admit a flaw or a sin. Um, I and I knew it because it's not on on one hand, you do want to be discreet about your finances. Right. Right. You you don't have to be like shouting from the rooftops what your bank account balance is. Right. Um, So that's not the type of information um, that I'm talking about and sharing. But I'm talking about the vulnerability of being able to say I'm living outside of my means. Yeah. And it's causing me to suffer. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's our topic for today. Personal finances. Yeah. And we're going to let God lead us through this thing in the way, because when I tell you it has been on my heart, he has been working with me. It's been a, it's been a lifelong journey for, for me. Somebody coming from poverty, um, coming from a household that routinely practice poor decision-making. Let's just say it. Can we, can we not to go? Cause you have a bunch, you, I bet you have a bunch of memories about that, mm-hmm. but can just to give people more context about the severity of your financial situation when you were younger. Mm-hmm. Could you give like first it's first one to pop in your head about that can just show truly how basically how Poe 
Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like how, uh, yeah, I like how uh, Viola, Viola, however you pronounce her name, I love how Viola Davis broke down the, the various uh, levels. Levels of poverty. Of poverty. Yeah. You know, and that she was at that very bottom level of po. po. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'll be, I'll be honest. I don't know if I if we were po. Mm-hmm. But we wasn't on the next level up from Po. Poor. So we were somewhere. Because there's Po and then there's poor. So y'all was somewhere in the middle. Not even in the middle. We oh, was okay. closer to the, the end po, of Po. But y'all wasn't fully Po. Yes. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know what? I'll say something. Um, but first I say this. Welcome back to another episode of, of Brave, Brave Conversations. Conversations. As you guys can see, we could not wait to just dive into this topic. And I feel like there's no eloquent way to really hop into it, but just to hop into it. Right. Um, but to give context, what I actually find sad now is that, ooh, and this is probably even a reference to how people are so hush-hush and quiet about their financial struggles, is that I feel like now people more openly talk about um, struggles in their childhoods and stuff until we're starting to see, oh, so this was like the norm for every household. The fact that we're eating sandwich spread sandwiches mm -hmm. and, um, man, it was times that we didn't even have bread for us. We always had sandwich spread though. That's no it. bread. Yeah. And, uh, but no bread. And I'll admit this. Sometimes the sandwich spread was looking real suspect. Wow. <laughs> Um, peanut butter, no jelly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously we went through, uh, you know, a lot, but I'm starting to see that that's a common thing with people saying like, oh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have food either. I mean, I'm just going to say it. We went through and you can probably read more of my book that's coming one day, eventually, hopefully God willing. But, um, <laughs> No, I mean, we went through things like uh, constant evictions and, you know, electricity, gas constantly being cut off in, in seasons where you really need those things. And so it was a lot of struggle there. So, yeah, we, we were Poe. Mm -hmm. We were Poe. Poe. Yeah, just admit it. You, we you were was po. trying not to, not to identify yourself with Poe. Yeah. But in my head, I was like, mama. You was Poe. You was Poe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, we didn't have, we didn't have necessities and the basic, very, the basic necessities, the ones that you truly do need. We didn't have those. And again, for me, it, it, it gets too gritty and too raw for me. Then, then I want to discuss on this podcast, read her book. And so that's why you we need to wait for the book to drop. It's going to drop. I'm speaking it to an existence. It's, yeah. When the book drops, we already in contact with her publisher. I'm exactly. No, <laughs> I literally have not written one line of a book, mm -hmm. but oh, that's I'm not true. You've written some stuff. Oh, I've written. I mean, I've been writing all my life. Period. Writing all my life. Writing hey, all my hey. life. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyways. Yeah, but personal finances is the topic. It's something that God has been placing on my heart very heavily for me for personal reasons. Obviously, for you guys as my my kids wanting to teach you better better habits, um, helping you to lead yourselves to financially wise decisions. And all the while, while I'm in my own home trying to, uh, handle the matters and, and, and get everybody in order and on track with it in my own home financially. I mean, I see outwardly, it's a lot of struggle. And I think probably more now than ever before. Yeah finances is something that every person, if they want to be honest and vulnerable, can admit that they're struggling with, whether it is uh, financially wise decisions, whether it is you're living outside of your means, um, whether it is that you are delusional and you are one of the sector of people who truly believe that the reason that you're struggling is just because is inflation alone mm -hmm. and it is, you know, it's the economy and it is your employer who's not paying you enough. And all of these things are valid. Don't get me wrong. Cause there are actual things happening. Yeah. yeah that's going to have to be another conversation, inflation but and taxes. <laughs> that actually brings us to this point right here because I have to deal, because even in a level of my, my job, um, the, the career that I have right now, 
um, it is a topic that's constantly brought up um, mm -hmm. as I interact with with patients and things is cost and affordability um, and things such as that. And that right there alone, because I deal with it day to day for years in, in, in my workspace and I deal with it day to day, obviously being the head of my household, it really caused me to challenge myself and ask myself the question. And I ask myself this question a lot when it comes to whether it's a bill, whether it's trying to decide something that I want versus something that I need. And that question is, is that there is a fine line between I can't afford it and I don't want to afford it. To afford it. Mm -hmm. And so I, the question is I ask myself is, can I really not afford this? Or is there some area of my finances that I am overlooking or being irresponsible in that if I change that up really could allow me yeah. to be able to afford this. Yeah. And so I feel like that is what I'm seeing out there with a lot of people. And um, just the other day I was strolling through social media and a very interesting little clip popped up. Uh, and it was of a group of women discussing how um, they, they read an article about women are friendships are being destroyed and they're losing friendship over financial matters because within friendship groups, you have people who they said can't afford to keep the friendship. Hmm. Be, and, and I, and what was even more profound is that a lot of women were chiming into the comments and really bringing up some serious topics. And, and one even posed the question that, you know, she's frustrated because she doesn't understand why a gathering with her friends always has to end up with a hundred dollar plus bill. I mean, that's a willow moment. Wow. wow. Cause, um, it is just that serious. And so when I saw that, I was like, wow, my God, I didn't even explore. Although we know finances can make or break a relationship, whether yeah. that's a marriage, marriage, um, family, family, yeah. you know, why you keep borrowing this money? You won't pay yeah. it back. What well, my $5? <laughs> Where my $5? Um, <laughs> yeah. it, so yeah. I've always known that, but now I think more than ever, I don't know why I didn't explore the fact that it is destroying friendships. And you know what? You wanted to know this is biblical because one of the main things that Jesus preached about when he was on earth was money. And the reason why I think that is is because he knew just how much it money plays into a relationship, not only with friends, family, but also your relationship with God. Yeah. You know? And so just to see how finances I have, has basically ruined all aspects of, relationships and this is not even just a now thing i think it's more prevalent now but if you look back this is had finances mixing money with relationships has always been a problem yeah even back when jesus was on earth you know mm -hmm. so it's not really a shock well it is a shock about how how detrimental it is yeah with something as simple as a friendship but yeah i think to get to the root of when we talk about personal finance um, and that's what I really want to dive into is that it, this is not going to be a one size fits all. This mm -hmm. conversation within itself is not a one size fit all. And in fact, I think we could probably have season after season, uh, multiple, multiple episodes of finance. If we really want to get, you know, like break down all the aspects and we probably of it. Will. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I don't know about anybody else, but I'm constantly looking at like other podcasts, um, other YouTube channels, of I've purchased some books um, when it comes to finances and it just seems like everybody, all, all the content that's out there right now, if I'm going to be honest, it seems like everybody is a financial scholar. I'm going to let y'all know. Somehow. Now I'm not. Um, no, I'm not. And so, <laughs> and what I find is that although I'm, I have to admit, I've received some very good information, some information that I have personally inputted into my practices, my financial practices. So don't get me wrong. 
But most of it is always talking above my head, if I'm going to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It is above my head. I think it's above most people's head, which is why people are still struggling. The average yeah. pe people, we're still struggling. Um, because honestly, most of this information is coming from people who have become very wealthy. Yeah. There's and a reason why it's called personal finance. Absolutely. Because really, when it comes to finances, there is no one size fits all. It really is a personal journey that fits and is tailored to your life yeah. and what God has put in your life. Yeah. So you have to look at that's what I wanted to talk about today. I just wanted to be vulnerable and kind of share my own financial journey without giving away a really good, juicy parts of my book. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to kind of and I think everybody that's where you have to that's where you have to start. You have to explore your own financial journey. And I think once you start kind of looking at your financial journey, where it began, gone, where you are now, you'll begin to reveal your habits. You'll re, uh, begin to really dig deep within yourself to kind of see um, what practices you have that are fruitful for for your finances and what practices you have that have been detrimental to your financial growth um, and your personal finance. And so for me, when I go back to my roots financially, obviously growing up in poverty um, played a huge part. Um, I'm the youngest, uh, you know, in my family as far as the order of birth. And that means I've been able to kind of be an observer of, of a lot of, a lot of situations. Um, and if when you know better, you do better was a real thing then I probably wouldn't have any any problems or any challenges within myself. But what I think we can all admit and be real about is that I think we know we have more information now than we've ever had before. But just we we not no ain't nobody doing better. Right. Um we're <laughs> and even though we know better and we can go find information and seek nobody's doing better. So for me when I break down my own financial journey, it obviously Poverty plays a, a, a huge part in it. Um, but what I think played a bigger part for me is when I was exposed first to the concept and the idea of saving mm. and saving money. And one thing I can always say about myself is because of one small practice that was introduced to me, very simple, it has left such an imprint on me that it's why to this day, I can honestly say that I'm a saver. I save money. And in times when I was young, I think people that was close to me and personal with me would be shocked sometimes. Like how in the, in the heck do you have this amount of money saved? Like where did it come from? Like what, what are you slaying it on the side? <laughs> um, and no, I wasn't. I just was a saver. And that is because my, my grandmother at a very young age introduced me to a piggy bank. She bought all of us. She bought me and my siblings, our first piggy banks. And again, just being a, a observer of her, she was a saver. She was one of them old school pickle drawer money savers. Um, she was, she just was a saver. And to be honest with you, like, I, I mean, you know, um, rest in peace, granny, my grandmother is no longer here. So I think it's kind of okay to reveal this secret um, because she's no longer here. But over time, as me and her relationship began to develop, um, now that I'm realizing in the area of, of finances, I think once she identified, and this is just me saying from our relationship, I think once she identified that I was a become developing into a good steward of saving money in that area of stewardship, being a saver, then I like to think that she confided in me more. And I learned my grandmother has several stashes uh -uh. of money. One in every room. That she yeah, that she was <laughs> saving. And um her nickname for me is a prilly May. And so she would say, um, come here, April May. And I would come and she would say, shut the door. And I, and I would shut the door. And then she'd be like, now, nah, rich around it. And I'm just playing. Rich <laughs> but, <around>. um, <laughs> but then that's when she would say, look behind this and, and grab. And, and when you feel that something that feels like leather, pull it out. And no, seriously. <laughs> so like, cause we all knew she had like these pickle drawers and stuff that she would hide. And, and it just, we filled to the top with money. 
And um, we knew that because she used to sell candy. She was the candy lady, too. Oh, my grandmother was an entrepreneur. Right, and she didn't even know it. Um, so maybe she, she was a, I Of course she did. She was the candy lady. And yeah, I don't know why people tolerated her. That's a whole We have to do a podcast on that because she was off the chain. She was uh, not always a nice candy lady. She'd be yelling at kids because they was taking too long to select what they wanted and choose. But she would have a – she had – it was a real candy store. Like, she would have – so many selections and then yet be yelling at these kids because they sitting there stirring and they can't choose. This is not the first time y'all been in my house. Y'all know what I got. And Make that's, sure you know what you want girl, when you Autumn, walk up in here. You are scaring me. It's almost like you was there because that's definitely the attitude that she had. Like, you just seen this selection. Right. Ain't nothing changed. <laughs> ain't nothing new. So many times. So, why are you taking long? And you know what you're craving for. But that is a, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But, um... All of that imprinted on me. It has such an impact on me when she would begin to reveal because my grandmother just, she lived normal. And I think as a, as a young girl, I, when she would begin to reveal to me like all this money she had, I was shocked. Wait a minute now, granny. You know what I'm saying? Like, what did you, what, what? Um, and so that had such an impact on me. It I, I can't really, I, I'm still exploring now what it did. Cause like I said, I think you have to really dig into your own financial journey to begin to help yourself in your finances. And so all I know is at some point, just witnessing these little things and witnessing her storing away money and um, witnessing her then, or having her then, purchase and give me my first piggy bank and I'll never forget not only did she give us our first piggy bank but she gave us our first starter money to put in the piggy bank and I'll never forget the instructions from her that basically she said yeah like once you put the money in there that's it even though a piggy bank had a way for you to get the money out actually the ones that she bought originally they didn't you had to break it piggy banks nowadays when you buy it it has a way for you to dig and get the money out but back in the day, it didn't. And yet you would have to smash it mm -hmm. in order to get the money. And so. Oh, that's kind of symbolic. Because once you go into your savings, that's it. Yeah. You hit, you kind of hit rock bottom. So what's the point? You yeah. got to buy a new piggy bank. Got to yeah. start back over again. I didn't. Yeah. Start back over again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think of it that way, but that's exactly how it was. And, uh. I remember when she gave us our first starter money and then when we would go to her house and stuff on the weekend, she would always ask me, hey, Prilly May, did you put some more money in your piggy bank? And I did. And I would. And when I tell you, it became it became a game. It became almost a challenge. I, I, I'm, I'm noticing it about myself. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Something in being challenged. I and see. So, um, so it became like a challenge for me. So it became exciting to... Mm. To, to be challenged to save this money as a, as a young kid to get 50 cents and resist the urge to run to the candy store like everybody else was doing to buy the candy because mm -hmm. I, I loved candy. And, um, yeah, I don't want to talk about my weight issues, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and being able to have the discipline to start saving money. But I think what really got me is um when I took my piggy bank to her house one time over the weekend and it was a, it was a, a, a see-through piggy bank so you could see the money in there you just when you just couldn't get it out um unless you and I tried and let me not act, act like holier than thou I try I'll never forget like I try to like dig in it with like um something thin to like get some quarters and stuff out and that didn't work I couldn't get it out and so uh, that really helped me not to like dig into it, my money as well. And so, but I'll never forget getting this approval from her. And um, she was just very pleased that I was continuing to save money. And then she gave me more. Ooh. And so she would give me more money. It was almost like she was, she would reward me with more money to see that I saved more money. That's Bible. Yeah, that's just it Bible. Just hit me. That's a biblical principle. Yeah, she would. Which we gonna dive into biblical principles yeah. to really help you? Because I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna get help myself. 
I want to grow and you know myself and I, I just hope that this blesses somebody else too because again I'm no scholar and if you're like me some of those channels that just go way over my head and like we just got to start at the basics mm. we need like the compound effect you know to go up and get better and I'm only sharing my financial journey um, in hopes that that would trigger something in everybody else to go yeah maybe I do need to go back to the beginning to see like, cause I'm very poor. Yeah. My spending is out of control. Like, where One, did this come from? A person that I'm going to be referencing a lot in this episode because he talks about finances and just try how to be a entrepreneur using biblical principles. Like he mm -hmm. he used the Bible to become a millionaire. Yeah. And so Myron Golden, he actually said that he said you need to go back and evaluate what your relationship is with money, yeah. like how your relationship how you viewed it, how you used it, who taught you, how they used it, what did they teach you about money, um, do you value money, do you not value money, stuff like that. Once you analyze that, you can really make a turnaround in how you basically, how your personal finances are. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. powerful. I, I didn't know, but I, I just was thinking of myself because um, I do meet people, and if I do happen to have a personal finance conversation with people, and depending on how what level they are in my life or how close they are to me, um, then some of them know uh, like much more intimately who I am as a saver mm -hmm. in, in sense of talking to a saver. And uh, people sometimes are very impressed with that. And I also notice that they somehow think that that's something that um, that you just came up with. Yeah. And I had to break down like why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, like realizing that I guess that's not a natural thing for everybody, but how did it become something that's a part of me? Like one of my staples. Yeah. Right. It is saving. And, um, clear example actually. And we can, how your grandmother, you saw that she had pickle jars of money. You picked up that. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was little seeing those big, like Hawaiian punch, like the Hawaiian punch jugs, juice jugs. I was going to say, cause we don't eat pickles yeah, like that. Like we, don't we used eat to eat pickles, pickles back stuff, in the day. But so. we had the Hawaiian punch juice jugs, like the big gallon y'all. And that would be filled to the top with, with coins, the, with the money, yeah. pennies, nickels, quarters, dimes. And I would, and I saw that growing up mm -hmm. and, and like I started, I never like started one for myself, but anytime I would see quarters or nickels or I would receive some, my first instinct without thinking about it is to go put it into your coin jar. Yeah. And that's a habit I just picked up because I watched you do it. Mm -hmm. can, growing I, up. can I say something? Mm -hmm. um, the reason that obviously clearly that had to be something I picked up from my grandmother, mm -hmm. but in the way that I would say, like, I think she used to use those drawers. Like, like I said, like her, the money she was earning from selling candy, she would mm -hmm. always um, store her stuff in, in, in those places. Um, but for me, the way that I would save into my drawers, my Hawaiian punch uh, jug was based off the fact that I hated change. Mm. I hated carrying around change. And back in the day, cash was, cash was still king much as I mean, now we all like swiping cards, but, um, back then cash was still king. And I personally hated change. Mm -hmm. I hated having to carry around change. And so instead of me keeping change in my purse or wallet, I would immediately after a day being out shopping or whatever, I would gather up all the change and put it into, um, the drawer. Sure. And if I'm going to admit one of the the most irresponsible things I used to do early on, because that was a habit that I had. And um, obviously they would be filled to the to the top. Right. And then sometimes even s starting multiple ones. Um, one of the things that I used to do and I learned from it is that when I would have somebody um, ask to borrow money from me. I used to give away that whole drawer. Oh, remember without, I've done that without several times. Counting and seeing I how had much no idea there. how much money was in there. Mm -hmm. And because it was coins, I just assumed can't be that much, but it was only because again, this would be people that were close to me. And so, um, if they would say, can you, can I borrow April? You got some money. And I would hand over the whole thing. And when they would go cash it out, it was from them reporting to me how much was in there that I started to learn my lesson. Like what? Yeah. What? Compound <laughs> effect. That little penny. Y'all don't think it's much. <laughs> That's actually, I don't know who made this, this, this story, this analogy, but they were like, oh, it was in the compound effect mm -hmm. when he was talking about having, um, and correct me cause you've read it more when yes. it was like a million pennies versus like, if you were to ask, would you like 
three it million was a, dollars. It was a time. Versus... If you do you want three million dollars or a certain amount of pennies that would that, that would, would add that would build each it. day yeah. over time. A penny a day. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. um, of course, he said naturally everybody would choose the three, three million, million dollars. But if you choose the penny, by the time um, the time frame is done, you would have like ten million dollars. Yeah, it would and accrue so, to yeah. ten million versus that person who only got that lump sum of three million. Correct. Spent all that money now at th- they had zero, mm-hmm. but you got this ten million now. You got ten million. Yeah. And so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that is a, p- a powerful analogy, mm-hmm. and maybe like we can get it. But it's in the book, The Compound Effect, which, again, like I said, I've been buying um, books and, you know, been reading books and just looking at things and really just trying to uh, improve for myself. And, um, but yeah, it, I had learned my lesson earlier on that what I would be shocked. And so sometimes they would report back to me, girl, you know, um, it was $62 in there in change. Whoa. Come again? That's a bill. <laughs> and you got to keep in mind this was like what 15 plus so years ago yeah and so uh yeah that's th- a bill there was a lot of money it mm-hmm. shook my soul and i and you just gave it to him i'm just like you stupid stupid girl like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what i'm saying no i you know it's a blessing to be a blessing and so no i don't have any regrets but it it would have been naive for me not to pay attention to that and understand. And so then that's when I would start counting it. Mm-hmm. You remember how the days I would pour it all out and then, yep, And you would count it. Yep. And then I would start counting. It. And then when like, uh, who is it? The grocery stores and stuff started putting those coin machines in, in their stores, then it made it easier. So I didn't have to sit there and pour it all out on my floor and spend hours counting through all that change. Um, I would be able to go do the whole cash in thing. But even then, I just felt like that was untouchable money. That's something that my grandmother taught me early on. Just, yeah, I'm telling you, she, it was not profound. She did not sit there hours and hours and grinding. When she gave me my first piggy bank, she simply just said, and when you put your money in there, you don't touch it again. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so that's kind of the concept that I would do, even with those the drawers of money. They would sit there sometimes for ages. For ages, yeah. And again, even though I knew how much money was in there, when somebody would ask to borrow money, that's where I would go. Yeah, I would give them the money out of the out of the drawers, or um, I, I got smarter over time, and so I would know how much money is in the drawer, uh, in the uh, the jugs, and so um, then I would just say, um, here you can go and get, you know, when the cash machines came in, the again these were people that were I, I trusted in a sense to go do this. Um, and so then I would say, her, you can get whatever amount out of this, then bring bring it back to me. And mm. they would or whatever. And, um, oh, I just feel like, y'all, don't sit here and think that we are. I just feel like the times have changed so much that somebody probably looking like, why would they do that? Keep Please keep reference in the time zone. And we have really kind of advanced a lot in the last decade or so. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was like back then. And so, um, I, that I had to realize and going through my own journey that that's kind of where it started, which then kind of helped me to speaking of compound effect, like build up to, um, really develop over time. Some of the practices that, you know, not only do I keep now in our household, but something that I've been trying to, um, teach you all. And that's where we are right now, right? Where I have these young adults and it's very important to me to make sure that I am passing on what knowledge I do have financially and then also realizing that there's still areas of improvement and growth that I even need. And guess what? We're going to take this journey as a family yeah, um, and get there. And I came to that conclusion when um, I personally began to kind of like speak to friends and just individuals in my life just kind of asking, like, hey, do y'all want to meet regularly and kind of really um, with the focus of improving finances? And that sounds like a great idea, and everybody would be so excited and on board, but I just seen that nobody really had the consistency um, to really do it. And so then I'm just like, I'm about to do this with my kids then. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to really focus on it because, again, people, it's uncomfortable for people. And like you said, if we made a plan and we made a plan that we was going to make wise financial decisions and then if we were supposed to meet next month and nobody really was making Making wise, wise you didn't want to face that. I like that you put it like that. I'm sure people didn't want to face it. So people just would fall off. It would be like ghost town. Like, yeah. 
hello guys are, are we still working on our finances like what, yeah <laughs> like what's going on um and so that's kind of leading us to where how we operate now as a family and i was hoping that i could be able to share that with some of you all um and hopefully we get some comments and stuff like because i'm always looking to improve i would yeah. love to hear what people are doing to try to improve their personal finance their personal spending um budgeting like how mm. do you guys operate in that and so that leads me to now, like as a family, we actually meet biweekly to discuss finances, yeah, personal finances. And so I meet biweekly with my two adults and we, we pull out statements. Yeah. We pull out statements. We pull, you know, expenses. We talk about financial goals, but I kind of want to... I'm going to ask you a question. I'll, I want to lay out the foundation for this. Mm -hmm. You have, you always said that you didn't want to do the typical, you wouldn't, you didn't want to practice the typical like black family dynamic when your children become adults, which is the age of 18. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I just personally saw how, and, and I don't blame anybody that makes this decision. And so, like, again, just going back to when you say personal, that means that that is personally tailored yeah, to it was a your personal, life. It was a personal decision you made for as a parent. So a personal decision mm -hmm. that I made is that um, just from experience and, and observance of what I've seen, I, I didn't want to, um, when my kids became legal adults, um, I didn't want to be put in a position where I had to kick them out on the streets. Right. Mm. Um, but at the same time, again, just being an observer learning, I also was like, but, but I understand why some households, why some families have to make that choice with their young adults. And I realized it was likely because their young adults were, let's just say they were being bums. Yeah. And I was going to point that out that you didn't, we weren't bums. Basically I wasn't a bum. You, <laughs> How I took it when, because you started really ingraining this concept into our heads when we were like really young. Oh, yeah, I was so like, young. Like basically probably toddlers. Toddlers. We didn't oh, understand yeah. what she was talking about. What is she talking about? Bills. What is she talking about? Careers. Yes. What is she talking about? We didn't understand at the time, but eventually I started to get up, get it, especially when I started to look into what I was going to do next with my life. Yeah. Watch the past video to exactly Talk about that but um you this is how i took it you was basically said told me and my brother aaron that as long as you guys are doing what you need to do meaning you are pursuing a career whether that be schooling or maybe taking up a vocational trade mm -hmm. and you are you know saving that you are being responsible that you are setting up your life in the way it's supposed to be set up yeah. for your next for your children for your next generation mm -hmm. then basically you would supply i would support y'all support us during that that phase i would financially support as the support as us the during head the start of this household up. yeah kind of like and i hate to bring this man up kind of like with donald trump <laughs> and how his dad gave him a small <laughs> loan of a million dollars so <laughs> he could petty. start his <laughs> business but look it's the same thing yeah that's that's actually this this what you did was you know, smaller in that scale, of course, much, but that's basically much, what you did. Much smaller. You supported our startup. Mm -hmm. And that's basically how I took it. Okay. She's going to support my startup as long as I'm keeping them my end of the end deal. Of the bargain. Yeah. I set standards. I set expectations. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, here's the thing. This is what's really important about it. I did not say that thing naively or, yeah. or lightly. I understood the level of sacrificing that I would have to take yeah. in order to do that. Financially. But I also knew the importance of setting the standards. Mm -hmm. And if you're not meeting the standards, I even yeah. mentally prepared myself for what I would have to do if, mm -hmm. if you all wouldn't meet the standards. Yeah. And I just wanted us to elaborate on that briefly so that people can really get a sense of, where we are now and why we are moving the way we are now. Cause mm -hmm. like, this wasn't just something, Oh, my kids are adults now. They got jobs. Let's do this. Yeah. This no. was actually something we've been preparing for years for. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on that real quick. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, no, that's good stuff because I, I did. And I think, again, I don't want people to go like, oh, they just came up with that. That's a good idea. And, and then you try to implement it and you're like, why is this not working yeah. with my adults and in my household? It's because it is something I like you use the word ingrained, which mm-hmm. literally is what it was. Listen to yeah, my listen voice. To because in order, for this, in order for this, and I've realized this and we, we can get, we can have a braver conversation later when, we see the end of this this period that we in right now but we really all do have to be on the same page yes in Ooh. order for this to work we have to be on the same page we all have to be responsible we all have to be consistent and we all have to be held accountable to each other and to ourselves autumn thank you in order for this to work she learning y'all yeah, she is learning. Um, look at what. Look at the Lord. Yes, look at the Lord. Um, <laughs> oh yes, you just let's do it. Mm-hmm. Let's let's. Yeah, this is this is probably just going to be part one of a lot of different parts that's coming. Yeah, because like I thought about what you said, and you was like, I don't want people to be like, oh, this is not working for me. Meaning, uh, when they try to do it with their adult children, realize that your adult children also have to be on the same page. It can't mm-hmm. just be you. Yeah, dictating what should how this is how we should do it. Blah blah blah. They should also they also have to, yeah, realize. Oh yeah, we should do it like this and participate. And I like that you said you know ho- that we hold each other accountable because we do. And mm-hmm. by no means is this this is not easy, you guys, because we're learning as we go. But like I said, we meet bi weekly. And I think that's something that we're learning to improve on is holding each other accountable, right? Yeah. So the goal when we meet bi weekly is um, for us to lay out our our finances, lay out our spending. So we pull out spending reports, um, being very open and vulnerable. You have to have trust. Yeah. And so, of course, we're trusting one another. And so if you sit there and um, let's just say spent a substantial amount of money on DoorDash. Which is a common <laughs> thread for me yes i'm i'm learning a lot of young people if i if i mentioned if we're talking at the water cooler quote unquote um with other like peers and stuff who have children close to my kids age i'm not trying to pardon you and help you to feel a little bit better about it but apparently this is a thing uh, oh yes baby i am of that generation i'm not ashamed <laughs> this, is, this is the now this is the new I think what I'm learning too, like when we do that, it's like, that's why we're really trying to, our focus is, is budget setting at mm-hmm. this point. And of course, when we meet bi-weekly, we're, we're checking, we're crunching the numbers to yeah. our budgets. So just to give you a play by play, when we meet, we meet as we set a time too. like, we're very strict with this. We set a time when we're going to meet, we meet at six 30. Mm-hmm. We all can um, join together in in the living room when we sit down with pen and paper or you know electronics whatever way you want to record things and the first thing we do for the first we we it varies every um meeting we take 30 minutes 20 minutes it Mm -hmm. depends on what you want to do and we basically go through the two-week span basically and we go through and we like calculate our expenses yep and for me it for every person it's different categories like for me i have a fast food category Cause I eat a lot of DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, all that. Mm-hmm. But I also have like Uber, Uber rides. Cause I take Uber cause we don't have a car right now. So I take Ubers a lot. So I have yeah. that as a category. Um, I'm just giving examples. Like it's different for everybody, but that's basically what we do first. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. it's good. And so, um, as I said, we hope to really dive deeper in that and kind of just share some of the strategies that we have been implementing in hopes that it can help other people. But to kind of wrap this, this was just a foundational episode to kind of lay out and just get the conversation started, get the brave conversation started on personal finance, right? So we're really hoping to hear from you guys, but I like to wrap this up with kind of talking on something that you just mentioned, which is that we don't have a car. Yeah. And um, that is a intentional decision now. Mm-hmm. It's almost a sacrificial yeah. decision and did we, did we talk about that we 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 talked about that on other episodes in the past like okay. obviously we um had a car had a very nice car yep but um i 2017 chevrolet equinox lt you so gray silly. and <laughs> it was um taken uh, by the water in the flood yeah the flood of 2022 the lord giveth and mm, the lord taketh, taketh away, away. Um, he sure did in a night. 
we'll have to do <laughs> I'll have to kind of like speak on that all yeah. together because that was really profound and what what it God shifted has, our whole life it did and it yeah. it whoo, thank it you, Jesus. shifted our whole life it did a lot and mm-hmm. so I have to talk on that and so after that moment this brings up again another very uncomfortable thing that talks about and I'll say this when people people don't know what to do they do not know what to do when they learn that I don't have a car you can see the, the, the struggle in people. Some people are like, what? How how are you functioning? Others are like, oh, you poor thing. Yeah. Um, And I've even had people who I thought knew me and that was close would even talk to me um, about that particular topic and be so off like the rails in their understanding of my intentional decision to not do this. Yeah. And it brings it back to the question of, can I afford to do this or do I not want to do this? And so they are very confused by that. So people always naturally assume that because I don't have a car that I can't afford to get a car. That's not true. And that's what she means by intentional, meaning like she has the money to get a car, a very nice car. Yeah. And she continues to earn and save because she's a saver more money to where she can even get an even nicer car. Yeah. One of the most, <laughs> the probably one of the most that, that just brings you back. People don't realize that this, this is a financial decision Yeah, to not have a car. Mm-hmm. It is a financial decision that, you know, things that are known to me mm-hmm. and are known to my children, but not necessarily have to be known to other people. But one of the smartest financially wise decisions that I made is that this is the flood. You guys remember the flood that happened in our region and even in other states, July of 2020, in this, um, July 26, to be exact. Yeah. It was July 26, 2022. I remember that because it affected me greatly. Right. In St. Louis. Um, and y'all, what's so crazy is that I didn't live in one of the flood areas. And in fact, you probably wouldn't know that I was affected by the flood in such a profound way because my area wasn't reported on the news. Nope. When I try to get help with cleanup, from nonprofit organizations? From the organizations that was helping everybody else who was impacted by the flood, they initially would not help me because they did not believe me. Yeah. Um, it was only when FEMA got involved and FEMA came out and saw with their own eyes. Um, and once I started, once FEMA physically came out and that kind of started helping me get, getting the help that I needed. Um, but it was wild and it, I was fighting many battles. I was fighting with my car insurance because mm-hmm. I'm sure they were hit up. We ain't naming no names. We're not. We ain't gonna name names, but, um, we're not, <laughs> not right now. Not yet. Um, but <laughs> I was fighting with my car insurance that I had been, um, subscribed to for decades. Mm-hmm. A perfect driver, no issues. You had no problem taking my money monthly, but the minute I need you this insurance that I have been purchasing, buying into, you try to play me, you got the right one. More on that in her <laughs> upcoming book. In my book. <laughs> and so I was I was battling that end. And so then when I reached out to the organizations, and again, I, I think I'll refrain for now from naming them. I'll name them in my book because I think it's important for people to know. Because I, And I did file a complaint, mm-hmm. by the way. I was able to go back and file a complaint because it was just insane to me. If you would have did what FEMA did, which is actually come out and see versus trying to go off what you were seeing on the news, social media and social media, if you would have came to see with your own eyes, then you wouldn't have been trying to deny somebody that was in need of help from helping them. But again, I don't want to get off that. But when I had lost my car at that time um, and I was still financing that car at the time, what I decided to do, because initially I just was like, I, I was going to get another car right away mm-hmm. um, instantly. Right. And so God was like, this girl's retarded. No, I'm just saying like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm trying to get your attention, child. Like yeah. <laughs> you need to settle down. But um, no, when that happened, I decided to take the amount of money I was already spending monthly on my finance payments to keep paying my finance payments but instead I was paying it to myself it was one of the wisest decisions 
I've made financially in this modern time. And although it was the wisest, it was also the most uncomfortable. It still is uncomfortable. Not only uncomfortable for you, because it was her car. But I, when I started driving, I started using it too. Mm -hmm. So not only did it shift your life, but it shifted mine as well. It was like, and again, this is where I'm sorry. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna continue. Oh, I'm gonna gonna let you finish, baby. Kanye ate me. I'm gonna let you finish, baby. (laughs) But Beyonce had. I'm just. (laughs) Um. But again, this is a part of how all parties need to be in agreement Mm -hmm. and on the same page. Yeah. Because I easily could have made a very bad financial decision Mm -hmm. when I got a car that I couldn't afford because I was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But I was willing to go through that uncomfortable moment and still am because I know of the financial goal we're trying to reach as a family. Yeah. Uh, Can I, like, again, Mm -hmm. I think in order for this to work, we got to really be honest with people because like you guys, she didn't want to listen to me. I would say out of, out of our whole journey as mother and daughter, um, you honestly haven't given me much pushback when I have made decisions and decide for our family what's best. But I would say that's probably one of the biggest things that you struggled with was when I made that decision and you feeling like that wasn't the right decision. Now, me being a mother, the mother that I am, I knew it was 100 percent coming from your flesh. Yeah, well, I could tell you one- it was. <laughs> I could tell you it was coming from my flesh. I didn't want to ride the bus. I still don't want to ride the bus. Exactly. I, I hate riding the bus in the Metro Link, especially now with me having a job and me having to be in different locations. Some locations that don't even have access, like Metro Link, Metro Bus access. Mm-hmm. And now I have to I have to spend extra money on Ubers. Mm-hmm. But money again, I could use somewhere else. This will be continued in episode two because that's what I wanted to talk about. In episode two, we're going to be breaking down what's affordable. And so I think initially that was one of the first things that you was trying to present as as a way that this wasn't going to work is how expensive Uber was. Yeah. And I remember I was just like, dear child, please pay attention. You taking those Uber rides to those locations that you need to take weekly is still not going to amount Mm -hmm. to the cost of financing a, a car, car. Mm-hmm. with full coverage car insurance car insurance and you did not believe me tax, at first you was not trying to see it and that. i'm like once you see the numbers you're gonna yeah. see what i'm talking about and that's uh-huh. a problem that a lot of people have like they're not looking at their money they're you, not looking at i it. was gonna bring that up people are not looking at their money but also people i'm gonna just talk about parenting you went when you were trying to get me to understand how financing a car and owning a car was more expensive than taking Ubers. Mm-hmm. You actually sat down and was very vulnerable and showed me this is how much I paid in personal tax. This is how much I paid getting um, the cars tax every two years. You did the two year thing. I know some people do the one year, mm-hmm. but like you actually broke down the finances and you showed me, you showed me the money. Yeah. I showed you. Show me the money. I showed you. And the a lot of parents don't want to do that with their kids. They don't want to take the time to sit down and say, this is why we need to do this. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. It's the why. Yeah. A lot of parents think, oh, just do this because I said so. Mm-hmm. If you show me the why, exhibit A for our personal thing, I guess. Uh, again, this is personal. Coming for me, up yeah. on a later episode, we'll talk about leadership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But one part of leadership is education. Yeah. Making sure you are clearly and thoroughly informing people so yeah. that they may cooperate. Yeah. With what and that's saying. basically what, what you did. You showed me the money. You actually, and you looked at your money. With you showing me the money, you had to really look into your own uh, expenses. I did. How much you were spending and stuff like that. And really be vulnerable with me and saying, hey, like in this area, and I, I never struggle. And I never done that before. That's yeah. the thing. Until that, until that flood and that happened, I had never done that before for myself. Mm-hmm. And I probably would have told you, like, it's so crazy to me. Like, people say, well, how do you do? Like, they don't know how you, well, how do you do that? Well, I take an Uber if I want to go somewhere. Well, isn't that costly? And, and I think everybody, because that's what I thought Look initially, at too. Money. Look at the money. I was like, oh, this is going to be too Look expensive. But when I started to crunch the numbers, I was like, What? Not only is this not expensive, but like then, of course, I get my groceries delivered. A lot of people ask me about that, too. Instacart. And they always assume that that's a lot of, of money. money. 
But again, once you crunch it to whatever lifestyle you have now, just currently start taking a look. And sometimes you have to taste and see, right? You have yeah. to just jump out there and give it a try mm -hmm. and see. But you'll be astonished sometimes yeah. when you're able to look at the difference. Because one of the first things that I saw when I started ordering my groceries is that I stuck to my grocery list. Oh, yeah. You have to be To strict. the T, like yeah. never before. And it wasn't that... It's like we all make a grocery store list right before we go to the grocery store. But once we get there, we see extra things. Extra stuff, and right. Next thing you know, I had planned to make spaghetti meatballs. And I still buy stuff for spaghetti meatballs. But by me seeing other stuff, I've also decided now, ooh, I'm going to make fried fish. Which that wasn't even on. No, none that of the ingredients on your, on your list. was on my list. Yeah. But now I've, I've gotten fried fish. But guess mm -hmm. what? With me adding a meal... To my week's groceries, that means I didn't make something else, which means eventually that food goes bad. So then that is a waste of money. Yeah. And so it's a lot of things that breaks down that people really don't consider yeah. that I didn't consider, you know, at it, first. It really helps me. It really helps me stay within my budget because I have a grocery budget now. Um, and we'll talk more on that in the second episode. But like, just to give y'all an an example of how not having a car has helped me is that I use Walmart plus. So like I'll start, you know, looking through and I'll start putting stuff in my car based off like what I plan to eat, but also how I feel like I might put, Ooh, I'm, I'm kind of in the mood for some chocolate. So I'll put some chocolate in there. But at the end of that, and I see the price and it's over my budget, then I have to go through yeah. and be like, I can live without that for the mm -hmm. two weeks. I can live without that. That's not even on my plan. And then, like, if I was physically in the store, though, yeah, I wouldn't see the price until I got to the, the checkout line. And I'm not finna go put all this stuff back. And I'm finna buy. Yeah, I was finna say, you gotta do with the embarrassment of, um, uh, take that, take that off. off. Take that off. Take them grapes off. And but I wouldn't do price. that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go through the hassle of saying, take that off, take that off, and then go putting the stuff back. Because yeah, you, you would be, go over budget. I would go over budget. I'm like, okay, I guess I just got to spend this money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the one of the first things that I saw because I am a, a site person. So I was talking about myself when I said, then you see other things and you buy um, and so when I first started um, having my groceries delivered, like ordering online and delivered, I noticed that once I made my grocery list, I stuck to just that, didn't buy one mm -hmm. single ingredient outside of the meal plans and the groceries that I had planned to spend. And so therefore I began to see, um, I don't want to talk about what we were spending yeah. monthly for groceries. We'll, we'll, get in, we'll get into it. Second, yeah. We'll get into it. Yeah. With the second but, video, um, but this, hopefully this has laid the foundation to open up the doors. Let us all speak. Yeah. Let us have this brave conversation. I'm, Personal finance. I'm really curious to see what type of financial, um, system that other people have established with if that's if you still have your adult children live with you mm -hmm. and maybe this is this episode will make you really anal analyze like do we even have a system yeah should we have a system yeah do we discuss these things yeah um mm -hmm. join us next episode as we kind of go into more of the details of our system and the challenges and triumphs yeah. we've had with that because this hasn't come easy. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned earlier in the episode that some people shut down and get defensive and things Set like that. Set yourself free, don't shut down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, with personal finances. We'll kind of talk more about that and how we overcome some of the challenges that we have. Um, but, yeah, hopefully you guys are ready to have this brave conversation with us. Yes. And share with us, what do you do? So to have this brave conversation, leave your comments, um, like our posts, share this video. You can follow us on our social media pages. We are on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, at Brave Convos. That is at sign B-R-A-V-E-C-O-N-B-O-S for the people who are just listening and not watching. Um, you can also listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, um, what else? Uh, Spotify. That's another topic we should talk about, Spotify, but yeah. we'll talk about that later. Um, and any other um, podcasting platform that you use, um, again, share this video, y'all. And we really yeah. want to hear from y'all. Like, comment. Like, if you listen, we know it's uncomfortable to talk about finances, mm -hmm. but set yourself free. 
Yes. Speak the truth. Yes. Stop playing. Yes. Let me hear from you. Did you guys, did did we say something that you feel like you want to try? Have you already been trying something? Do you have some input that you can share with us to help us to even improve and get better? Let us know. Um, and that's it for us, guys. Hopefully we didn't keep you too long. But if we did, hopefully you gained something from the time that you gave to us. Right. And so with that being said, let God do his part. Let, Let God, God do, do his, his part. part. All right. Peace, y'all. Bye-bye.